Back in our episode on scrolls, we told you all about how scrolls were made and where they fit in the entire history of reading material that would eventually lead to what we call books today. Or rather, books about 20 years ago because everything went digital and read out loudable. No doubt you'll recall that writing started out on things like wood and bones, tablets of wax and stone, and gradually progressed to things like papyrus. Then came sheep and goat skins, calf skin and its refined form, vellum, and soon it was all being rolled up into scrolls on a couple of spindles. Not terribly long after that, the difficulties of using scrolls for anything besides reading lengthy royal proclamations meant that the codex was developed. Your scroll would be accordion folded so it could be displayed as single pages and bound between two boards. Now, with a codex, you could mark your page and refer to more than one place in the scroll at a time. Which, we may have said at the time, meant that every book you've ever read was really just a modified scroll. At least, before the internet. And books on tape. And certain podcasts' monthly supporter chats. Anyway, that discussion brought about a few questions about other sorts of books or book-like things. What's a grimoire, then? Some of you asked, while others wanted to know about tomes and incunabula and the differences between them all. And we thought, great, easy episode. We don't even have to think of a topic. We'll just explain it all in one go and then that's it. Cover all the little intricacies and we're done. So here goes. Scroll and codex you already know about. If not, go back and listen to the scroll episode, then come back here. A grimoire is a textbook of magic spells and summoning rituals used by magicians to call forth demons and the spirits of the dead, construct amulets and talismans, and prepare magical tools. Everyone used to make them, from the ancient Mesopotamians right up through the Persians, Greeks, and Romans, and on to the Jews, Christians, and followers of Islam during the medieval period. Even some of the various popes used them. Much like today, they all claim to tap into some more ancient form of magic, regardless of what period they were actually written in. But most turn out to have tapped into the imaginations of their current day author instead. The rest were pretty much reprints of earlier, not quite as ancient as they claimed, works. A tome, on the other hand, is a word used to refer to particularly large books, especially if they are one part of a larger set. Say, one of the volumes of the old Dead Tree versions of the Encyclopedia Britannica, or the full Oxford English Dictionary. They're heavy, full of paper, and generally so big they need their own little stand to sit on so you can read them. Your local library probably has a really large reference work out on display where anyone can look at it, which would qualify as a tome. And an incunabulum is any book printed on a press before 1501, usually from a wood block rather than movable metal type. Incunabula just means either swaddling clothes or cradle, and was meant to imply the earliest or first stages of anything to which it was applied. For some reason, it got as far as the earliest days of the printing press, and then stuck to books to the exclusion of most everything else. Once again, we'd like to thank you for listening. No, that's probably not going to work, is it? But that is where the information more or less runs out. There's just not that much to actually know about the various kinds of books. Once you have a book, all things that look like books are books, just with specialist names. It turns out not to be all that interesting once you've explained and understood the concept of a book. Except... Well, except for the fact that not all books are precisely as book-like as other things which are traditionally regarded as books. Take, for instance, the all-wood books of a Xylotech. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Before we get into what a Xylotech is and how to spot one in the wild, we're going to have to spend a few minutes explaining where they came from. You see, towards the end of the Middle Ages, which, as you will recall, was right around 1500, a year selected as the arbitrary point where the Dark Ages ended and the Renaissance began, even though we know there's no such thing as a hard and fast boundary between the two, and it was more of a gradual shifting of one into the other over the course of many years, toward the end 
of the Middle Ages. It became fashionable for men of learning, men who wanted to be seen as intelligent and well-read, and most of all, as masters of all this new learning and all these new fields of knowledge that were popping up all over the place, it became fashionable to display the signs of their knowledge in a prominent way. And so, we presume to the dismay of many a housewife of the day, they would leave the fruits of their knowledge scattered all over the place. Remember that just at the turning of the Dark Ages, a sudden interest in the natural world and its workings were all the rage. Why, you couldn't be anyone important at all if you weren't peering into the deep, dark recesses of Mother Nature trying to work out how frogs happened, or why birds turned into fish in the winter, or even which plants were good for treating headaches. See our episode on willow bark. So it became the fashion, in certain circles, to signal your intellectual interest in the natural sciences by leaving bits of it laying all around your home. Again, we're sure, much to the consternation of your significant other, who probably wasn't as interested in the natural world as they were in the unnatural way you kept bringing bits of it inside. Much like a cat, which has recently caught something terminally squeaky. So, also like a cat, you'd capture some poor defenseless bit of moss, mollusk, or mouse, plop it down on the furniture or floor, and wait for your friends to come around and admire it. Which they inevitably would, because they were doing exactly the same thing with the expectation that once they had visited you, you would in turn visit them and make all the same noises of admiration. What an extraordinary seashell you have there, I've never seen the like, they might say, knowing full well that at some point your turn would come to peruse something from their collection of engraved peas and remark how absolutely ebullient you were about their tiny copy of the Odyssey immortalized on a broad bean. Even if you weren't. But you would be. Because in the late 1500s, men of learning liked nothing more than to both learn and be entertained. Knowledge for its own sake was fine, of course, you had to have that. But it was also a bit boring all by itself. Far better it was if the knowledge, or rather the ignorance engendered by the knowledge, was also a source of entertainment. It was very much of interest to the neophyte scientists of the day to try to work out how the world worked. Much of what they initially claimed would now be considered patently ridiculous, but only because we now know better thanks to all those early efforts and the debates they undertook about all these objects while trying to refine their ignorance. Sure, we know many birds fly to warmer climates in the winter now, but back then no one could quite work out why they disappeared each fall and returned in the spring. Some people thought they went to the water and turned into fish for half the year. It wasn't right, but you try explaining it if you don't know about migration. Which few people really did until about 1822, when a European white stork turned up in Germany with a 30-inch African spear through its neck, and people started putting two and two together to reliably arrive at four. Anyway, all these seashells and rocks and bits of plants and dead birds and stuffed alligators and things hanging around the place were getting out of hand, especially since so many of the people who were interested in them were what we now call Renaissance men, which means that they were men who had a wide variety of interests, knowledge, and specialties, and were constantly experimenting on their ever-growing collections and learning more. Men of the Renaissance, and here we're just going to stop and say that yes, there were some women involved in all this too, but by and large, the people that got written about and remembered were the men. It's not right, it's not fair, but it is what happened. See, starting in the ninth century, something called scholasticism cropped up. Basically, it said that Aristotle was the best and smartest guy ever, and as such, you could save a lot of educational time by just studying Aristotle and his methods and your Bible. Hopefully, by a series of reasoned debates, Aristotle style, you could reconcile some of the many contradictions between, say, the philosophical world and your basic Christian teachings. Eventually, it worked so well that some people began applying the Aristotelian method to things beyond the Bible and philosophy as they explored the emerging new areas of knowledge. Except, of course, the average person wasn't allowed to and wasn't able to study the Bible on their own, by reason of it having been rewritten in a language they didn't understand. Latin. 
only certain people knew Latin. The common man didn't, so they found themselves cut off from the ability to independently learn about not only their own religion, but the world around them as well. So the pursuit of knowledge in medieval and renaissance Europe was left, by and large, to the priests and clergy of the Christian church. And so, they soon became the keepers of most of the free-range knowledge running around at the time. Aristotle and his philosophy and your religious dogma all came under the church, and the church only worked in Latin, and no one who wasn't already a priest was allowed to learn Latin, and this double especially excluded women, because women weren't allowed to hold positions in the church in the first place. So no Latin, no schooling, nothing. Most women never had the opportunity to learn what they needed to learn in order to contribute to all the natural science going on by the time the Renaissance really got rolling. Eventually, thanks to numerous reforms and people entering and then leaving the clergy for a variety of reasons, but taking with them the knowledge they had gained there, it became possible for some men to know more and think about more than the church would really have liked. As we'll see. Now, some women, a very few, mostly in and around Italy, did manage to learn Latin and gain access to other areas of the new knowledge through their husbands or fathers. This let them in a tiny bit to assist in making discoveries in the Renaissance world. However, the majority of Renaissance women who did contribute to science at the time did so under the auspices of their husbands, employers, or male friends. Tycho Brahe's sister Sophie helped him take notes on the Nova of 1572. John Dee, mathematician and magician, made observations of his wife, Jane Fromond, as part of his studies. And the Italian naturalist Aldrovandi married his second wife, Francesca Fontana, not just because she had a sizable dowry, but because of her learning. Which is a good thing, too, because Ulysse Aldrovandi had a lot on his plate, what with being the father of natural history and a true Renaissance man, with a varied interest and knowledge in several different fields. He studied law, Latin, mathematics, and philosophy, and branched out from there into logic and medicine. But then he said the wrong thing and got himself arrested for heresy in 1549, which most people would consider to be a bad thing. The getting arrested part, at least. And the thing about this was, a lot of people, well-educated people, learned people, were getting arrested for heresy around the same time. All this learning about the natural world and then talking about it or writing about it was a real problem for the church of the day, who felt threatened because not only was their absolute authority being called into question, so was God's. As the church gathered up all the various heretics that were suddenly cropping up all over the place, they'd arrest them and hold them for trial and eventual sentencing. Which meant that when Aldrovandi was sent to Rome under house arrest, he was in some pretty good company. From local scholars and other heretics from around Europe, he developed an interest in botany, zoology, and because there wasn't a word to describe an interest in rocks and things, invented the term geology to cover the study of the structure of the earth and the rocks in it. Once he was released in 1550, he quickly organized a series of expeditions all over the Italian landscape and began to collect and catalog plants wherever he could find them, which, as you might suspect, was just about everywhere in Italy. The more of it he collected, the bigger his problem became. How to know what he had and how to organize it all so he could find what he had when it came time to write about it. Which is where Aldrovandi's wife, Francesca Fontana, comes in. She had all the money, remember? And after Aldrovandi spends time walking through the gardens of his friend Francesco de' Medici and making a list of all the most valuable plants found there, he decides he has to have specimens of them all in addition to all the things he's already collected. In fact, the whole tour around Italy, tearing up the countryside, was one of the first botanical expeditions ever mounted. That is, an expedition explicitly intended to collect and catalog plants. With Francesca's money, he could afford to make several such trips, and because she was at least as intelligent as he was, she could help organize the plants he collected in ways that made sense. In the meantime, with Aldrovandi's wide-ranging interests and expertise, 
he'd built up quite the collection of things. Things from the natural world that were just sort of scattered all around in piles and stuffed into corners and shelves. It certainly went a long way towards establishing his credibility as an expert in the various fields he undertook, but it did little to facilitate the ability to study or understand most of it. By 1595, he had some 7,000 specimens of one sort or another, all having to do with the natural world and the new natural sciences. There had to be some way to sort it all out and make sense of it. So, he got a cabinet. Not just any cabinet, mind you. No, indeed. See, back in those days, the word cabinet referred to a kind of room. And it still does today when you think of things like the President's Cabinet, which referred originally not to the people the President picked to advise him, but to the room in which they met. Essentially, it meant a small, private, enclosed room, though now that definition has both expanded and contracted. Today we think of cabinets as pieces of furniture with doors and shelves inside, but the word can also encompass those things one would put in a cabinet. With his wife's money and her organizational skills, and probably quite a lot of her doing the actual work, Aldrovandi built a cabinet of curiosities to display all the things he'd collected from the natural world over the years. Each item was sorted and described and put on display for anyone to see, admire, and study, much like modern day museums. And, of course, to entertain themselves with speculation about the origin or purpose of the various objects. Because, you see, the real fun was not in knowing precisely what something was, where it came from, and how it was used. The entertainment came in by trying to guess about the details and debate the possible explanations for an object's existence and usage. Facts were fine, but clearly defined areas of ignorance were more fun. And there was plenty to debate. Nothing on display in a cabinet of curiosities was meant to have a full explanation. Knowing everything about a thing removed the opportunity for actual curiosity. If you know it all, what is there to speculate about? Nothing. So most items in a cabinet of curiosity bore the smallest and most minimal labels stating at most an object's name and a very brief description. Take, for example, our old friend the unicorn horn, about which you can listen to our unicorn episode for more. Stick a horn in a cabinet of curiosity and tag it with the words unicorn horn, but actually it's a narwhal horn from the far north, etc, 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 and you remove the entire possibility of debating whether unicorns exist or not, how best to catch one, and what magical properties its horn might have. If nothing else, we'd be out an entire episode, and the Renaissance would have lost yet another fun discussion about just what the world was really like. Much more fun was to be had the other way. And yeah, up to the point where we actually explain what we're on about, that does make this show a sort of audio cabinet of curiosity. So Aldrovandi and Fontana sorted out his 7,000 specimen collection, stuck little labels on it, and put it all on display in one of the largest cabinets of curiosity ever seen. We don't know exactly what was in his in particular, but many such cabinets would contain items from every emerging field of science of the day. Interesting rocks, cultural artifacts, archaeological artifacts, religious relics, historically significant items, statues, paintings, antiquities, interesting animals, and plants. Especially plants in Aldrovandi's case. Thanks to his botanical expeditions, he had more bits of plants than he knew what to do with. But again, with the help of his wife Francesca, he dutifully sat down and catalogued each one. He didn't, as you might be expecting, set out to grow his own specimens of each and every one of them, though. That's just not practical. Many of them wouldn't even survive in his local climate, for one thing. Instead, he set out to build an herbarium. Now, you already know what an herbarium is, you just don't know that's the word for it. Picture, if you will, a small child bringing its mother a flower they picked from out in the yard. Maybe it's a delicate little bluebell, or a bright yellow daffodil, or possibly a red rose. What does mom do with it after she smelled it and admired it to the satisfaction of the child? One of two things, probably. On the one hand, she might put it in a vase with some water and admire it for as long as it lasts before discarding it once it has passed its view-by date. On the other, Mom may decide to preserve the flower forever by carefully pressing it between the pages of the biggest, heaviest book she can find. And that's what an herbarium is, a collection of pressed flowers. Except a bit more. See, a useful herbarium 
will contain as many relevant parts of the plant as it can. Stems, leaves, flowers, seeds, fruit, and roots, wherever possible or practical. It's important to get as much as you can because this herbarium is going to be a reference work not just for you, but for generations to come as well. And it's important that you write down as much as you can about your herbarium. And those bits you can't include, particularly messy fruits for instance, or bits of the plant you weren't able to get because it was the wrong season for the flowers to be out, or because you could only find one specimen and it was incomplete, well you got an artist in to fill those in for you so that people at least knew what the missing bit looked like. And then, to make an herbarium really useful, you had to do one other thing which was to sort all the plants you had collected into groups by your best guess as to their related species. Because eventually, guys like Carl Linnaeus, whom we've mentioned before, are going to come along in the 1700s and want to see your herbarium because they're trying to work out a system of names for all the things in the world that categorizes them in such a way that when they say something's Latin name, everyone knows exactly what they're talking about and they can all discuss it together to determine how things are related to one another. And then, science is really going to get going once everyone understands what everyone else is really talking about. Suddenly, it's possible for anyone with an interest to not only know things, but to be able to learn new things about the things they know and share their discoveries. But maybe you've spotted the problem with an herbarium already. Sure, it works great for most plants, anything soft and squishy enough to be made flat and at the same time be preserved by the process, which many plants can be, is fair game for an herbarium. But there's a certain type of plant which does not avail itself of this process. It's very hard to squish a tree between the pages of a book. So you had to do something else if you were going to make an as complete as you could herbarium for as many plants as you could. And what you did was very carefully take samples of branches, leaves or needles, and any fruit, cones or nuts produced by the tree in question, and lay them very carefully inside a thin, hollowed out box with a hinge on one side. And this box would, in the best herbariums and cabinets of curiosities, be made of the wood of that very same tree with a binding and cover made of its bark. And then, you could store that book of wood in a cabinet all its own, along with other such books of trees. A cabinet called a xylotech. Once again, we'd like to thank you for listening to another episode of the show. The presence of your ears is a delight, and we're quite happy to fill them with knowledge and entertainment. GM Word of the Week is supported by our many patrons on Patreon. They keep the show ad-free and in return get some nice little bonuses like transcripts and early episode releases. If you'd like to join them, head over to GMWordoftheWeek.com and click the yellow banner at the top of any page. Unless, of course, you've turned off the yellow banners. In that case, head to our support page there. Thank you kindly if you already support the show. It's much appreciated. This episode was inspired in part by The Madman's Library by Edward Brooke Hitching, a link to which you can find in the episode's description. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey, whose mother was never a big fan of pressed flowers, it seems. Music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. <laughs>